All right, um, let's go and get started. So happy to have you here. Uh, for those who, of you who are joining us, um, I'm Xavier here. I run the demand gen team at Televerde. As you can see, the topic that we'll be talking about today is how you can combine the human touch with marketing automation. I have our wonderful Ashley Cruz here with us today. She is our know-it-all expert uh, when it comes to marketing automation, and we're excited to have her. That's awesome. I'm changing my title for that. <laughs> so I'm Ashley Cruz, as Xavier stated. I'm the marketing automation supervisor for Televerdi. I've been doing marketing autom automation for about seven years now, almost eight. And so I'm excited to be here and share some of the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. Awesome. Um, so before we jump into it, I just want to give you guys a quick background um, for those of you who are new to Televerde, who we are, um, what we're about, what we do here. So you can have a little bit of background there and then we'll do a quick agenda and then we'll jump right into the content. So for those of you who are new, um, Televerde is a, a B2B company or a B2B sales and marketing company and we specialize in driving demand and helping our clients generate revenue. As you can see, um, our business model is predicated around um, uh, helping incarcerated women um, reduce the rate at which they return to, to prison by providing them with valuable marketplace skills where they can go out and actually be um, a value to a lot of our you know, clients that you see here on the slide. And then also a lot of them come and work uh, for Televerde. Um, so with that, um, the model is kind of the icing on the cake, like as we, we say, but the, the core of what we do is actually driving demand. So we've been around for 25 years and our specialty is in helping companies drive more qualified pipeline, more leads, whatever you want to call it, more revenue for your company is what we specialize in. And we do it through a couple of different ways. And marketing automation is one of those big pieces um, that we recommend that every client utilizes. And today we're going to walk you through how you can leverage your marketing automation investment to make sure that you are getting the best quality pipeline, you're getting deals through the pipeline as fast as possible. And then also you're generating a return on investment from um, your MarTech uh, tools. So to give you a quick agenda, we're going to talk about the marketing automation foundation. So what are the pieces that you need to have in place? What is a nurture? How do you structure that nurture? What are some pitfalls? We're going to talk about how you can effectively reach your prospects. So what messages, um, what content, what copy, what cadences, things like that. And then we'll also talk about common pitfalls. So things that you should avoid, things that you probably should have in place that most companies don't have in place that'll help them leverage their automation tool uh, even better, but also make sure that they don't make the mistakes that a lot of your competitors are making or a lot of other companies are making to help you stand out in the marketplace. So with that, a lot of words really fast, um, let's go ahead and jump into the content. So uh, the first thing we want to talk about is when it comes to market automation, Ashley, what, what do you look for when you're selecting a tool? So at a high level, there's a couple of things that I typically look for. One is what's the bandwidth of my team? Are they going to have the ability to spend a lot of time in training? Do they need something that they can train on and get up to speed on super quick? Or is it somewhere in the middle? Because a lot of the tools that are out there, they have similar functionalities, but based on what your team is able to learn and the time frame that you have to learn it in is really going to determine what you want to pick. It's very common for companies to have um, their teams come and say, okay, I want to do marketing automation and I want that in two weeks. It's not really a lot of time to sit and take months and months of training to get you up to speed. And so you need something that meets that timeline. Something else that I look for on um, the other side of bandwidth isn't necessarily how much time they have to train, but what is their bandwidth to use it on an ongoing basis? Do you have the team available? Do you have multiple people in house that you're going to be training or is it going to be a solo type of role and they're going to cover just marketing automation or are they covering other aspects of your marketing team? Because that's going to play a part in determining, you know, what is um, the ease of use? Because there are different tiers of marketing automation tools and based on your team's ability to train quickly and be able to spend the time in the tool is going to impact what they should be using. Yeah, and I really, or I really like that approach because I think when most people go and look for a marketing automation tool, they look at features, benefits, the things that the tool can actually give them, but they neglect the, the component that makes the tool actually work is the people utilizing it. So for, for reference here at Televerde, we use Marketo, which for those who, who use Marketo, there's a pretty long certification process that you go through to understand the ins and outs of the tool, and it's not something that you can stand up quickly. Um, for most companies that want to stand up a marketing automation tool pretty quickly, um, you're looking for something that has less features and options 
um, but is more applicable for your team. So Marketo might not be a great fit for every company, which is why there's options like HubSpot and there's also smaller you know, marketing automation tools that are available. But I think it's important that you look at the team that you have in place, what are your, what are your actual needs? And then also too, what is your budget? Because your budget's not just for the tool, it's the budget that you would have for training the staff and for the hours that they've just been actually implementing, executing the tool. So I really like that. Um, when it comes to selecting a tool, so we talked about the, the bits and pieces, what features or which benefits for a marketing automation tool are really key for, for any company to have? So just about any instance that you purchase, you're going to have the ability to do emails, mm -hmm. right? Now, not all of them are going to give you the flexibility to do the emails in the way that you want. And so that's where um, it's going to come down to how many emails are you wanting to send? Um, what does your cadence look like as a company for sending those out? Because if you're doing a lot of emails, something like a Marketo is going to be super beneficial, right? If you're not doing a whole lot and you're not really concerned about the amount of effort it takes to get them out because you're just trying to get your name out there and get some marketing done, then, you know, to your point, a HubSpot might be better. But anything that has emails, landing pages, the basic assets, forms um, are going to be really, really beneficial. Also, if you can track um, your websites and then anything that has the ability to either have lead screening out of the box or has it as an add-on or some sort of a tool like a campaign or a program that you can create that allows you to score that data is going to be extremely beneficial. Yeah, and we'll touch on lead scoring and, and the importance um, as, it, as it pertains to you know, combining marketing automation with the human touch. Because lead scoring is one of those pieces that a lot of companies look over or they put a basic scoring model in place that doesn't actually benefit their down the road uh, opportunities as it reaches sales. So I think it's important that you have a tool, one that meets your needs, one that meets the staff that you have, but also has the features and functionalities that can apply to the rest of the sales process and not just a tool that sends out emails. So as, it, as we move into emails, so let's talk about a couple of different ways that you can send out emails through a marketing automation tool. So at Televerde, we like to make sure that our clients have nurtures in place to help support sales activities. What are the, like the core three nurtures that a company should put in place from a content perspective? So that's a great question. Um, there's a million different types of nurture streams out there. And if you're just starting in marketing automation, there's really the core ones that um, are good to focus on. Whereas as you start advancing, then there's definitely other add-ons that are gonna be beneficial. But for today, we're gonna focus on um, a couple that talk about going through the, the buyer's journey, right? And so as part of the buyer's journey, everyone sets this up differently. There really is no one piece fits all. But as long as you're covering all three aspects, then you're going to be golden on figuring out who you should be focusing in when you should focus on them. So part of that buyer's journey is um, there's three phases. There's the awareness, there's consideration, and there's conversion. Mm -hmm. Depending on where you're looking online, you might see different verbiage, but at, at the core, those are the same thing. And I really want to point out that for that first phase, awareness, it's not necessarily brand awareness. I know a lot of people get confused with well, I want people to be aware of who I am. And so I'm going to send out all emails that talk about me and my brand. Mm -hmm. That's not what that's used for. Awareness is making your customers aware about potentially having a problem or needing a service or a solution within their company that they weren't thinking about before. Yeah, and I think that's a, a good point because uh, in the marketing space, you hear a lot of people talk about awareness campaigns or awareness this and that. And it's really just an excuse to talk about yourself, mm -hmm. uh, especially at the top of the funnel. Customers don't really care who you are. They care about how you can help them. Right. Later on in the funnel, it may make sense to talk more about your brand or for us, talk about the purpose a little bit more. Um, but the awareness piece of it should be more customer centric than it actually than most people make it out to be mm -hmm. to focus on what their problems and solutions are to see how your company aligns with those. Then you can start to talk about yourself. The way that I think about marketing is it's like if you're meeting someone at a party, you don't go up and propose right away. And I think that's what most people do with their nurtures is, hey, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. I'm great. I'm great. Here's case studies. This is why I'm great. Instead of, hey, how can I help? It's nice to meet you. I'm Xavier. What do you like to do? I like to go hiking. Those types of things like getting to know your customer and actually building that relationship, I think is important to have in that awareness nurture. And I think it's often overlooked. Um, so that's the top of the funnel. So awareness, building awareness, not just talking about yourself. What's the next piece? 
So the next piece is consideration, right? So most people that are in this phase, they've known each other, they know what they like, they know what they don't like, they're aware that there's an issue and that there's something that they need to fix, right? So it, it look at it as they're considering their options, mm -hmm. right? They know that people exist in the market, they know that there's people out there that can fix their problem and they're going through and they're taking the time to look at who's gonna be the best fit for them. So they're listening to webinars, they're doing case studies, they're looking online to see who they wanna work with, not necessarily who can solve my problem, because they already know, right? There's gonna yeah. be 20 people out there that can solve your problem, but who's gonna work best for you and who do you like? Yeah. This is typically in the, to your analogy in the dating cycle, whether or not you're going to continue on dating or if you're going to stay friends. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So considering, so at this point, as some of you have seen, there's research reports saying that most of the buyer's journey happens before they come in contact with you or your nurture. So they've done their research. The awareness piece of it has helped them identify that you can actually provide a solution for their problem. And the consideration phase, they probably looked at a bunch of different vendors and now they're just deciding, okay, who's actually going to be the best fit for me? And then they want to understand at a deeper level what that solution is going to provide, why you're better than the competition. So that's where it may be appropriate to talk about um, your brand or talk about your company a little bit more or results that you've provided for other mm -hmm. people in their situation um, in this consideration stage. And that's the way that I align these nurtures that I talk, I think about it as like top of the funnel. And this is more of the middle of funnel stuff exactly. where um, you're providing more research reports and guides and ebooks. So it's much more value driven but the content is not uh, surface level. It's not, hey, I'm gonna show you this big broad thing. The middle of the funnel stuff is a little bit deeper and it's aligning more to your solutions and topics. So that way a prospective customer can say, okay, now I know that Televerde can provide the solution. It seems like they have the skill set or the expertise. Now let me stack rank those against other options in the space to figure out who I want to, to decide on. Right, which goes right into the next phase, which is conversion. So they know all their players. This is where it's going to be super beneficial to say, this is why you should pick me, right? And they've heard, they've seen all the things that you have to offer. They've compared you maybe on their own, but anything that you can provide them about maybe a vendor comparison of, you know, this is what we do compared to what this other person does. It's not a bashing session against your competitors. It's really being factual about how you align and where your um, key pieces come into play, mm -hmm. right? How you stand out. And also, you know, they're gonna look at cost. Yeah. This is where the ROI calculators come in because you know what, you may be more expensive than your competitor, but at the end of the day, you can also give them a better return on their money. Yeah. And they take that into consideration. Everybody knows that you, you get what you pay for, Mm -hmm. And while someone may be cheaper or more expensive at the end of the day, it's what are you going to get back from them that really counts? Yeah. Because people will make budget available if they can get something in return that's going to make them better than they are today. Yeah, exactly. And, and to give an example there, at, at later stages in our funnel, there's um, you know, content that we would want to have in terms of like making the case to outsource. So we're an outsource you know, portion of someone's demand gen or sales team. So content that would be applicable there is why you would want to outsource it or how to position it to your, your C-suite or your board members or things like that that are a little bit more actionable. And then also helping them see what the ROI of our service or solution is. As you had mentioned it, we may be more expensive than some of our competitors, but why do we justify that cost? Why is it um, better to choose us? And I think in the SaaS space, like in the software space, the, a lot of companies do this really well by admitting their flaws up front. So right. in the SaaS space, they have like reviews are huge. So everyone has a review page on G2 or somewhere, Captera, where they can see, you know, what's good or what are the pros and cons of the software. And I think in the service space or in a lot of industries, most companies want to hide those flaws. And I think this is a point uh, of the funnel where you can talk about, okay, here's the pros of Televerde, if we're using us as an example, and here are the cons. Here's why we may not be a good fit for you. And here's why we're a great fit for you. And I think the reason why that would be applicable is because it makes your sales team happy in the back end. If we can disqualify people who shouldn't be at this part of the funnel, um, I think our sales team would be much happier, but also we're closing more business on the back end, which I think is important to have in a conversion nurture. And I think that most people miss that piece is that it's okay to admit your flaws, but it's also okay to brag about yourself a little bit. Here's why we're better than the competition. But again, as you had mentioned, not making it a bashing session. Right. So um, now that we have the structure of the nurtures, we have the top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and bottom of the funnel. 
how do you structure these emails? Like what, what would a top of the funnel email look like? Like what are the bits and pieces of, of the core things? So across the board, the structure should be very similar, right? It's going to be the content that you're providing. That's going to be slightly different at the top of the funnel. You're giving things that are educational PDFs, things, and you shouldn't necessarily require those to be gated. Yeah. Right. Because it's things that they can get on your website. It, you can send them in your email because you really want to focus on it, but they can get this research anywhere. Yeah. Right. Um, whereas as you move through the funnel, you want to have gated insight. You want them to fill out a form to get it because it's of more value. Yeah. Right. Because that helps. But when you're determining what's the layout of the email going to look out, look like, what type of pieces do you need in there? Um, based on our success, we've seen that when you're doing subject lines, anything that's action based mm -hmm. really gets people to open. Yeah. And I'm a huge supporter of doing a B testing when it comes to your subject lines. Because an action-based email might get me interested, but maybe you don't care so much about that. And something that's a little bit more descriptive is going to be um, something that you're interested in and make you open it, right? Yeah. And so uh, as you're building out the nurtures and you're thinking about what information do you provide and how do you provide it? Like I said, I'm just, I'm a key component. I know a lot of people do A-B testing up front, which is one way of doing it right? Where you send out a small portion of emails, whoever opens um, the most, mm -hmm. that's the email that you're going to go with, yeah. right? Another side of that is, is maybe you have limited content and you really want to get the, the biggest bang for your buck. Another yeah. way to do it is you send out an email with a subject line that's action-based. Anybody that doesn't open it in a week, you resend out that same email, but change the subject line. Because even though it's the same email, people will see a different subject line and if it resonates with them, they're going to open it. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think it's it's really applicable to companies that don't have um, big content libraries available where they can split test different types of content. Just split testing the subject line. I mean, for most emails, if I see it that has a poor subject line, most of the times I'm looking at emails on my phone. If I see that subject line isn't interesting to me, I archive it right away. Mm -hmm. So that's your first, first entry point is having a subject line that conveys. And I, I thought it was really cool that you look at everyone that didn't open that first initial email and then resending them a different subject line to see if that's applicable to them. Because I think about it in my own space, I get hit up with emails for webinar invites or demos or things all the time. And most of the time I'm not in market for that, that service or solution, but there could be one key headline that I get and I'm like, Oh, this is actually a little bit interesting. And then I start to dive down that rabbit hole. So um, I think it's, I think you call it like meeting the buyer where they are. So it could be a certain subject line that hits a pain point for them at that moment. And again, that's the, the first the first point of it. So A-B testing subject lines and then resending to people that didn't open with a different subject line. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the next piece of it? So the actual body, super important. You know, um, in this day and age, people don't wanna sit and read a book, right? Yeah. And so you have very limited time to catch their attention. So you should have a hook yeah. in the very beginning of your emails. Another thing is you don't wanna be so vague that they don't know who you are or what you want mm -hmm. because they're going to delete that just as quickly as um, a 10 page email. Yeah. So where's the sweet spot? And it's going to be different for every industry. Honestly, some you need more in there because of what you're selling, especially if it's, they're already your customers. Um, they already know, and they're going to sit and read your email because yeah. they're interested already. Right. But if these are brand new people, they don't work with you. They don't really know a lot. Three paragraphs is good and not three paragraphs like in English where you have to have five <laughs> sentences, a beginning, a middle and a close. Oh, right? I hated those. <laughs> <laughs> because they're not reading an essay. Yeah. Right? But like three paragraphs where you have two to three sentences, some might have a little more that's really going to capture them. And as you're including that insight, you want to make sure that you're giving them clear insight into what you want to do right? Because some people, they have the most perfect subject line. They've got a down pat. They get opens for days. Mm -hmm. They have really great copy in their email, but nobody knows what you want them to do. Yeah. Right. It's a little confusing. So really having clear call to actions in place of what is it that you want them to do? What are you looking for? Right. Another thing that um, can really distract people in the email is if you have too many call to actions, uh, yeah. right? So like you want them to join a webinar, but you want them to look at your website, but you want them to contact you and maybe you want a demo. It's too much. Yeah. 
right? That's why you have the nurture with the different stages and the different emails is because it gives you that opportunity to promote all those things. You don't want to give them everything and the kitchen sink in that first email. Yeah. And I see this in a lot of like company update newsletters where they'll send out a newsletter, like here's things that are happening. And it's like a blog post and then register for a webinar and then contact sales if you have questions and then do this or that as a, you know, someone that's busy, like you don't know which direction you should go in. And that's why it's important to break your nurtures down into these different, you know, buying cycles, because you would, if you know, like, let's say someone's in the conversion stage, you know what call to action is applicable there. You know what's going to, what the next step for them should be. And that's why it's important to kind of zoom out and look at what that journey is, because then it'll make your emails much more effective. If I get an email with six different call to actions, I'm going to click on what's important for me right now, which may not align with what your business objective is. If you wanted me to sign up for a demo, but you bury that at the bottom of your newsletter, the chances of me clicking on that are slim to none, because I'm going to get distracted with the blog post or registering for your webinar mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So having clear call to actions, don't do too long on the copy. Three paragraphs is kind of the ideal space. And again, not three structured paragraphs where it has to be what, five <laughs> or six sentences or whatever right. that used to be. Um, yeah, I think copywriting is something that people look over um, and they say there it's not it's not a big deal. Like I'm just going to put it in here. I'll have my legal team look over it, my HR team look over it, and then you really get this really inflated, bloated copy right. that doesn't drive results. Okay, so I really like that. So now that we have the content, we have clear call to actions, what are some other things that you want to take into consideration when it comes to the actual body of the content and the, the copy of the email? So even if you're just picking like one call to action, mm -hmm. display it in different ways because everybody absorbs information differently. You know, yeah. have a button, have a visual, put something in text, Yeah. right? Because I can tell you that um, I'm probably more apt to click on something that's text-based because I'm reading it and I'm yeah. going to click on it as I'm going. Whereas I can guarantee you there are members of my team. I won't throw any names <laughs> out there that they're going to see a picture. They're going to be like, Oh, that's pretty. I'm clicking. Yeah. Right. So everybody absorbs information differently. And also, you know, if you are going to use images as well, mm -hmm. three images, don't go crazy. Today's day and age is all about visual, but there is a big difference between an email with images and an infographic. Yeah. Right. And so the more images that you add in when you're sending out an email, it increases your likelihood of going straight to spam. And then it doesn't really matter how much time you've spent on your copy and <laughs> yeah. your subject line and everything. No one's going to see it. Yeah. So just taking into consideration the amount of images you're putting in there and also adding images that correlate with what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about having an event for people to go and run a marathon, don't put something in there that's talking about, um, going to happy hour in the image, yeah. right? Because they don't go together. Yep. They need to correlate. Yeah. So making sure the images are contextual to what the actual email is about, limiting mm -hmm. the, the number of images that you have in there for deliverability, but also for ease of readability. Like if I have an email that has just a bunch of pictures, like this may be applicable if you're in the e-com space where your product is visual and they actually right. have to see it. But if you're in the B2B space, like most of our clients are, um, you don't need a ton of images to portray what you're doing. Maybe you can have one hero image at the, or a call to action image or something like that um, in the email, but limiting those one for deliverability so they actually get to where they're supposed to go. But also, again, not to confuse the buyer. Exactly. Okay. And icons are different than images too. Just keep that in mind. You can yeah. have small little icons to like accentuate because you want it to be uh, pleasing to the eye. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to do big images, just keep them to a minimum. Yeah. And then the, there's a couple of different things with images too as well. So one, it helps deliverability. Um, another thing is that uh, here at Televerde, I see this a lot, is the spam filter blocks a lot of our images and I just see the alt text of those. So do you recommend that people update that alt text there? <laughs> you know, it, it helps, <laughs> you know, especially um, there's a huge movement about website accessibility, Yeah. right? And you want to make sure that whoever you're sending emails to, regardless if it's B2C, B2B, this is something that's going to be consistent, is that by using that alt text, then you know, you're giving a description of that image is because if they haven't downloaded it and you put something there, they're more apt to go and click to download the image, which is now an open. Yeah. Because you've just got them super curious yeah. or, you know, with um, the disability rights that are out there, you want to make sure you're not excluding anyone. You know, everyone yeah. has the ability to have an interest and everyone has the ability to potentially purchase. So you want to make sure that you're making your emails as widespread as possible for everybody to access them. 
Exactly. Yeah. If you put this much work into the nurtures or the copy, the content of that, you want to make sure that they get to where they're going and deliver the message no matter who they are. Right. Um, okay. So we have the content, the copy. What about cadence? So how often should you be sending emails? Every day. I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't do that. Um, <laughs> you only do that if you really don't want people to talk anymore. But, um, you know, it depends on the type of email that you're doing because Today, it's also common to use marketing automation to send out marketing emails, but also do um, a mass push because your CEO wants to send out something. Yeah. Right. And so, and those are two different types of emails. You have newsletters, you have all of these different things. So a good rule of thumb, honestly, overall is no more than two emails a week. Um, and it's really great to have something in place that says if they've gotten an email within the last 24 hours, because you're doing event reminders or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, that they're not getting a ton of emails all at once. It's yeah. good to have that check in place. Gotcha. Okay. So limit the emails, make sure that you're not overwhelming people. Um, make sure that your copy is clear, concise. Um, if you're going to have visuals, limit them, make sure that they're applicable. Uh, don't go too overboard on the copy. Um, A-B test subject lines to actually get people to open the emails and then structure out your nurtures based on the buyer's journey. Yes. Okay, cool. So that's the, uh, the piece of effectively reaching your prospects. So we, we put together nurtures based on the buying stages and we've hit all of these things. Um, let's talk about how we actually apply the human touch to this. So we have all these emails going out. We have these nurtures that we've built. How does that correlate to the sales process? So this is where lead scoring is going to come into play. Okay. Right. Because you can send out a ton of marketing emails, but if you just start sending everything over to your SDRs, your ISRs, whichever team that you're utilizing to call on these prospects, at the end of the day, they're going to look at them. They're going to say, marketing doesn't know what they're doing. Their stuff is crap. Yeah. Which we hear all the time. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to call on that. Marketing doesn't know what they're doing. Yep. But by taking lead scoring and putting that into play, what you can do is you can start to prioritize these records. Yeah. You can see um, as they're going through the funnel, you can target very quickly, who is a hot person for you to call on because they hit a contact me or maybe someone that's more, they're warm because they opened a couple emails, they did some clicks, they did some websites, right? Yeah. They're a true responder, not just opening a bunch of emails, yeah. right? Because they're engaging with you. Yep. And then there's going to be your cold database. So those are people that either um, their purchase list, they haven't engaged with you, they haven't really opened anything per se, but you know that they're within your target persona and you still would like to call on them. Mm -hmm. So by going through and having your lead scoring set up, you can really prioritize your data, which is going to help your, your calling team not only know what to touch first, um, but it's going to give you a little bit more credibility mm -hmm. in what your leads are when you're sending them over. Yeah. Right. And so I think we should probably take some time to talk about scoring. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about lead scoring. So um, you talked about the, the priorities of the lead scoring. So we have cold, warm, and hot. Um, and we talk about you know, how that helps the calling team or the SDRs prioritize that calling. How should you have a lead scoring program set up? So the majority of marketing automation tools today, they're really great because they come with an out of the box model. Yeah. However, even if you need to use that out of the box model, which I do guarantee, I, I recommend going through and using pieces of it because especially if you're just starting out, you don't know. Yeah. You know, and a piece of lead scoring that I think gets, that gets really confusing is people think, oh, I put my lead scoring model in today. It's perfect forever. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's not the case. So you, you can look at the out of the box model and you need to pick and choose the pieces of that out of the box model. Like yeah. for instance, Marketo is really great at the fact that they have emails, they have websites, they have um, maybe a download versus a gated form. They have all these different options. But if you're not sending emails yeah. <laughs> that connect to those options, then you shouldn't turn them on because what's gonna end up happening is your scoring model is going to be off because it's looking for things that you're not actively using. And so no one's gonna meet your threshold. Gotcha, okay. Right? Yeah. So using the out-of-box scoring model kind of is the basis, but also continually making tweaks to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think one other thing it would be nice to add, and I think is one thing that helped us develop our, our lead scoring, is communicating with sales. So sales has certain criteria of leads that they want. If the, at the end of the day, the lead scoring is helping us pass these prioritized leads over to sales, we should probably figure out what they want. So mm -hmm. what are key things that sales are looking for in order to put that in place? 
So what do you recommend in terms of like putting together a service level agreement or communicating with sales to figure out what those lead scoring pieces are? So anytime you're going to do lead scoring, um, I'm not going to sit here and say it's an easy process because um, I have helped companies do lead scoring models that we've set it up in a day because they, they knew their stuff. And I mean, quite honestly, they had just started. So there wasn't a lot of stuff that you had to know. Yeah. Um, whereas there have been other ones that were extremely complex. They had to be separated by region. They had to be separated by business yeah. model. And it took months to like finalize because as you're going through those pieces, to your point, sales needs to be involved. Yeah. It is not a marketing decision. A hundred percent. Yes. Marketing needs to be involved because you know, the emails and the collateral and the information that you're providing the channels that you're utilizing and that all comes into play. Yeah. Right. And that's more about the engagement. Yeah. Whereas sales is going to be focused on your firmographics, your demographics, things of that nature, everything that goes into the profile. Yeah. And so it's really good to meet with your sales team and say, okay, what type of leads are you looking for? What, what tells you that there's a higher propensity to close? Is it a revenue range? Yeah. Is it maybe that they're in a specific industry, mm -hmm. right? Something I, I typically consult on and say, please stay away from is BANT criteria. Yeah. Well, yes, it's nice to know that someone's going to close in three months. That shouldn't impact your profile that you're targeting. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. And it's also one of those things that are harder to target through marketing automation because you're not gathering a lot of those details that an SDR would gather on the phone in terms of like having a communication. So it's harder to ban qualify based on lead mm -hmm. scoring than it would be to have an actual face to face interaction. Right. Um, and the way that I look at it is lead scoring is just setting the stage for a conversation. I think most exactly. people think that marketing automation can take it all the way to close. And in some industries, not B2B, but in you know some B2C industries, marketing automation can close deals. But I think for the way that we do business, um, marketing automation is really just to serve up that opportunity for that human inter interaction to happen. Exactly. And lead scoring kind of facilitates that. So now that we've talked a little bit about lead scoring, um, how do we take those insights that we got from lead scoring and then serve that up to sales in a way that they can use? So now that you have your priorities set, it's a great idea to send those leads over to your SDRs and the types of information that you really want them to be able to see is what activity was taken that gave them that high priority score or that warm score, yeah. right? Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on this piece because it's a whole nother webinar, <laughs> but really making sure that your SDRs know how to utilize the tool that they're working in so that they can easily prioritize those records. They know what to look for. They know what it means when yeah. you say hot lead, right? Um, also another piece of marketing automation that isn't necessarily out of the box, but it typically comes as an add on. And if you can, is a really great functionality is they have some sort of a sales insight tool. Right. And it makes it super easy yeah. for your sales team because they put chili peppers or they put like little stars or they put something on there that tells them this is who you need to, to focus on. So they're not having to filter as much yeah. on the different fields that you're passing over. Um, and one of those insight tools typically will really outline um, the emails, the website engagement, everything in there for them. So it's just really a click through. Right. Yeah. But even if you don't have the sales insight, you don't have to have that to be successful. Yeah. It's great. It's easy, right? But it's not required. It's kind of like you don't have to have powered windows and everything to drive a car, but it really makes it easy so that you don't have to crank it. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So, but providing them activity information, explaining to them in advance that this is what you're going to be receiving. Cause this is really a pitfall for people. Yeah. Right. They just pass everything over and they're like, okay, sales, go get them. And they're like, I don't know what I'm looking at. Yeah. Um, and that can be a problem. Yeah. So just taking that time, doing the due diligence, helping them understand how to process it and also going over now that you have these leads, what's the best way to, to track the statuses and provide feedback because that's going to go into the next phase of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think too, with, with lead scoring and just kind of the sales insights is it helps sales trust that data a little bit more when you just mm -hmm. pass over and say, Hey, these are scored leads inherently sales is like okay scored leads what does that actually mean and in the space that we are in, because there's so much activity from prospects um, whether it's on the website or with forms and stuff we want to make sure that we give sales something to work off of we don't want to just pass them you know scored leads and say hey go and contact these people because 
marketing is going to give the, the data one story and sales is going to give the data another story. So we want to make sure that those stories align. And that's the, the key piece is because marketing automation is just serving up that interaction for sales. If we can serve up that interaction and say, hey, by the way, John visited this case study and registered for this webinar and went to this page, that SDR is going to have a much better conversation with John and be much more likely to close that deal than if you just send it over and say, hey, John has a lead score of 25. Go get him. So, That's a great point. So like having a content library too, yeah. that's easily accessible. So anytime you send out emails or providing content, making that available for your sales team so that they know what you sent. Yeah. And so when someone says, oh, well, I opened this email, they're great. And they know the content that was in there and then it makes them more knowledgeable yeah. when they're speaking to you outside of, oh, that's awesome. You received <laughs> one of our emails. So let me tell you about this, which was already explained in the email. And now yeah. you kind of have lost a little bit of credibility. Yeah, it's disjointed. So by using that, those sales insight or the interesting moments or whatever you want to call it inside of your tool, it helps the SDRs have a better, more congruent conversation so that the sales process doesn't feel disjointed. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, especially in the, really in any marketing space is that uh, the buyer's journey is going more and more digital. So there's right. all these digital touch points, whether it's emails or ads, and making sure that those are cohesive and aligned, make sure that the buyer doesn't get confused. So as we, going back to the point we talked about in your email, you don't have multiple different types of call to actions, but you also don't want that same thing from your buyer's journey. Where an SDR is talking about this, but your email they just got was talking about that. And for a buyer, it gets really confusing. Like, do these guys actually know what they're talking about? Mm -hmm. Or who should I be speaking with about this? Because I'm now more confused that I've been getting your emails in before I, you know, reach right. out. Um, okay, so let's talk about it full circle. So now that we've got the lead score and we served it up to lead uh, to sales, they've got the prioritization. They have some of the moments to to actually connect with the SDR. We know that the buyer's journey isn't a static straight line. What happens when someone falls off? What should, what should we do? So. The other benefit to marketing automation is now that your your sales team has done this great job of collecting all this insight and they've tagged the data is really listening to what they're saying. Yeah. Right. If it's qualified, awesome. You have revenue. Yep. Right. Not really much you need to do there unless you're wanting to send out some customer information and you just want to like stay top of mind because you have the ability to upsell or whatever it may be. Right. But what about everybody else? So maybe they're not interested today or they're telling you, I'm not a decision maker or I'm not the person you should be speaking to because I'm just the janitor. Yeah. Don't really know how you got my information, right? So those aren't really people that you want to spend your marketing dollars contacting. Yeah. And then the other side of that is you purchased all this data or you gathered all this data just to find out that Mickey Mouse isn't really a person <laughs> um, per se. I mean, Disneyland. Yeah. But from a business perspective, maybe not. Yeah. You know, unless... They want to be called that, but, um, <laughs> so you might not have valid data, yeah. right? And so how do you look at all of those items so that you're not losing people still, right? Because there's still potential. Yeah. So for anybody that's not interested today, you want to have the ability to send them back into your marketing automation tool and feed them up, nurture emails. That doesn't mean that you call them today. They say, I'm not interested. And then you send them an email tomorrow. That's not going to get you very far, <laughs> but like if you have date stamps in place and you have the proper tracking in place, maybe yep. in 30 days, you send them an email, Yep. right? Just so that you're top of mind. So when they do get to that point where they're ready to purchase, they know that you've cared enough to listen to what they had to say to begin with. And you're still providing them information that um, connects with what they told you about. Yeah. So that they come to you first when um, they have the money available. Right. Yeah. And I think that goes back to the whole sales marketing integration thing. So we're combining the marketing automation piece with the human touch. The human touch is informing the marketing automation piece at this point instead of the other way around. So when something goes to sales and they say, uh, this person is not interested, I think most people will say, okay, let's jump on that and nurture them right away. You should probably have like a cooling off period where it's right. like, depending on what your sales price is for your product or how long your sales cycle is, you can kind of get a feel for, okay, this person is going to be back in market around this time. That's probably when we should start communicating to them again, uh, again to increase their lead score so they can go back to sales is the ultimate goal. So just bring it in full circle. So what do you do with invalid data? So we talked about, you know, qualified, obviously we, we want to upsell. Those are or, golden. Yeah, those are golden. <laughs> those are the ones that we want. That's the perfect straight line that we look at. Uh, we talked about the people that are not interested. We want to recycle them based on the reasons that, you know, sales had, had, has given us to bring them back to sales when they're ready. What about invalid stuff? So with the invalid data, this, this piece is super important, right? Because a lot of times people do get purchase data from maybe 
like um, a tech target or a vendor or um, they get an intent data, whatever it may be, right? Yeah. They're purchasing data from somebody. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to review what your contract states because there are vendors out there that if they give you the data and you call on it and it's bad and you realize it's bad, you have a certain amount of time to go back to them and say, hey, I purchased this off of this list yeah. and it's no good. Yeah. Not every vendor, but some of them out there, if it's as part of your contract, reimburse you. Yeah. But if you don't stay on top of that data and say you have 60 days to notify them from the time that they provided it to you and you've called on it and now it's 90 days, you've just lost money. Yeah. Right. Whereas before, if you, if you stay on top of it, you can get a new record. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think cost efficiencies are important. So not only are you procuring data, but also if it's, if, even if it's not data that you purchase, if you spent marketing dollars to advertise to these prospects and that's how they joined your opt-in list, or um, if you have a large investment for your marketing automation tool or your MarTech program, every tool that they touch that has a cost associated with right. it. So I think about it, if we spend X amount of dollars on Marketo, every time we send an email, it costs us X amount of dollars because that's what we spent for that tool. So if you think about it in that term, in that mind frame, you want to be much more efficient with one, who you're sending the emails to, mm -hmm. what data you're putting in your tool and what data you're taking out of your tool. So what do you recommend for the invalid data? Do you tag it? Do you put it in a different platform? How do you deal so with that? So I'm a huge component of getting rid of it mm -hmm. because especially in marketing automation tools, right? A lot of the times you're charged based on the size of your database. Yep. So they're not valid contacts. And this goes the same for anybody that says I'm the janitor. Yeah. And if you're not a cleaning, like that you're promoting things that they're going to use, then you probably don't want them as you know, most companies, the janitor is not going to utilize um, one of your service tools. Yes, yeah. they're also the CEO. You never really know. So, you know, you need to handle your data accordingly. But if they tell you I'm not the person, it's bad data, you know, go through the process of cleansing yeah. your marketing automation tool. And if you have to have it tracked somewhere, you can put it in your CRM. I know a lot of people house it there. Even still, I mean, I'm a little on the fence about keeping it there because if yeah. you can't ever market to it, then it really shouldn't be there. And I've heard from sales, well, what if I find this person again and yeah. they come back up? Well, then treat them new yeah. and go through it again because if they were invalid or they weren't the right person now, that doesn't mean that they didn't get a promotion or that they didn't update something, Yeah. right? Yeah. But, and I understand that you wanna see all that activity. At the end of the day though, is it really valid in tick activity if they didn't give you the correct information at the time? Yeah, and I think as marketers or just in any space, people hear data and they wanna hoard. I wanna have as much data mm -hmm. as possible. I wanna keep it all, I don't wanna delete it. I don't, <laughs> I don't ever wanna lose this data because data is the new gold or whatever you wanna call it. And uh, it's kind of a bad, frame of mind to be in when it comes to your market automation tool. One, because you may be getting charged on the data, but two, it's probably irrelevant. If someone is not, is it's bad data, let's say you have a bad phone number, bad email, you're not able to ever contact them. Even if they have activity that's available, it's not applicable to you. It's not helping drive your business forward. And then even in the case where, you know, in our space, someone is not a, a right contact at that time, but they get a promotion, they're a right contact at that time. We want to start seeing the activity when they are a right contact. If they were invalid, they could just be searching everything. Right. And it doesn't really inform our sales process now. Our sales process now starts from when our new interactions start with them, not what they did 12 months ago when they were a coordinator of marketing and not the director of demand exactly. or something. So, Agreed. Okay, so recycling it, looping all around data strategy, um, cleansing the bad data. I think we've covered it all. Is there any other pitfalls that people should walk, um, should take um, into their, you know, their programs and figure out, you know, hey, these are things that we should be doing or things that we probably should avoid to make sure that we don't make costly mistakes? Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, every business is different. I know people say best practice. I really don't care so much for that because yeah. yes, it might be a best practice for the industry, but it's not a best, best fit for you. Yeah. So really taking that information and learning from it and growing and constantly reviewing what content are you sending? What information are you providing? How are you scoring? What is your data telling you? Yeah. And revising it instead of um, just having it stagnant is really going to be what's going to help you the most. Yeah, right? definitely. Just going through the process of keeping it fresh, learning from what people are telling you, right? Because if people are responding to you and they're telling you, I'm not interested, or they're telling you, this isn't what I want, they're talking to you, yeah. right? They're telling you 
how to move forward in the future. And one of the things that I hear a lot is, oh, I didn't get a deliverable. It wasn't successful. They're not qualified. I didn't get anything from it, but yeah. everything, every data touch is valuable. Yeah. Right. Everything that you can pull from the data, from what people are telling you is going to change how you do your business. If you're willing to listen to it and implement it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that's a bombshell to end on. I mean, um, <laughs> I don't really have anything else to add to that. Uh, so for all of you that are attending, I appreciate uh, you guys showing up. Appreciate Ashley for coming here to share her uh, wisdom of marketing automation and all things around it and how to integrate that with, with the human touch. If you guys do need help with your marketing automation, you need help driving pipeline, again, that's what we do here at Televerde. So feel free to reach out or you can register for an upcoming webinar or reply to the email um, that you got for the registration of the email. We appreciate you joining and we will see you guys on the next webinar.